Uh, Dr. Dr. Kellist. Hello, Dr. Kellist. Yes, Dr. Maha, we are ready. Uh, Dr. Alexandras is going to join 2.15, exactly. Okay, so what do you suggest? How do you suggest that we, 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 do, we do bring you Dr. Shigidi? Okay, that's okay. okay. okay Just give fine. us five minutes okay. to allow participants to register. Okay, fine then, okay. All right. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello, participants. Welcome to the groundwater session um. at night. Say greetings from Entebbe. Dr. Kalist is going to be our moderator. And uh, we have a uh, a number of very good papers to be presented this afternoon. And uh, please write your name, your affiliation in the chat box. Use the Q and A box for posting your questions and write the name of the presenters uh, to enable him to pick the question and then to answer later. Uh, we're going to present the papers first and then we'll give time for each presenter to reflect on the questions that was raised on the either the chat box or the Q&A box. Thank you very much. Wishing you a pleasant delegation. And um, um, uh, Dr. Kallis can take it over from here. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Dr. Maha. Uh, for the introductions. Uh, let me take this opportunity to welcome all of you, ladies and gentlemen, to another session on groundwater, where we'll be sharing experiences on conjunctive use of transboundary surface water and groundwater resources. And this uh, webinar is going to run from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. And we have a number of presentations from a number of experts within the region and outside. And uh, as Dr. Ma has mentioned, we will be listening to presentations. And as the presentations are going on, we want to encourage you to post the questions, comments in the chat box so that the presenters can respond and any other person that is attending this session. But towards the end, we shall have opportunities for questions and answer, where we also reflect on the issues that will have been posted in the chat, but also any question that can be raised verbally. Again, I'm called Dr. Kalisti Ndimugaya. I work for the Minister of Water and Environment in Uganda, and I will be your moderator for this session. And I'm happy that you have decided to prioritize this session. According to the program, we are supposed to have welcome remarks and introduction to the webinar by Dr. Zebene Lakewu from Ethiopia, but he's not yet online as far as I can see. Uh, when he comes online, we'll give him an opportunity to set the stage. I think he's held up in other uh, activities. But without wasting any time, we are going to move into the substantive presentations. And the first presentation, I see Dr. Alexandros. I hope you are ready. Uh, we are going to listen to the presentation on conjunctive use cases from UNESCO projects. And this is going to be delivered by Dr. Alexandros Makalgakis. He is the regional hydrologist based in Nairobi, regional hydrologist for UNESCO based in Nairobi. He has more than 18 years of progressive responsible experience in the field of environmental sciences, under which he has done a lot of international work in developing and developed countries, focusing on natural resources management, water, and environment. He's currently the director and representative of UNESCO at the regional office for Eastern Africa based in Nairobi. 
Dr. Alexandros, I want to take this opportunity to invite you to make your presentation. You have 10 minutes to make your presentation, but I'll allow a few more minutes in case you need it. So over to you, Dr. Alexandros, if you are ready. I see you are muted. So if you can unmute. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Kalist. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here among uh, colleagues and friends. Uh, if you allow me one more minute to open up my presentation so that um, I can share it with you. Okay, I found it. Hello, Alexandros. Hi, Maha. Uh, thank, thank you very you. much for the invitation, first of all. Uh, just to say that on behalf of my organization, we are uh, extremely happy for the opportunity to cooperate with NBI uh, for the co-organization of this session on, on contracted water uh, uh, management. I'm going to now try to share my screen. Here we go. Um. Is this okay for everyone or is it in a weird format? Let me try to see. Is, uh, is this? It is fine. Yeah, it is fine from my side. So you can go ahead. Okay, I'm sorry for some leftovers. So um, I want to thank also uh, my colleague and friend Neno for uh, supplying me with a lot of the information that you're gonna see today. Uh, uh, I owe him big for the presentation. So uh, just to, to, to start with some basic information, we all know that we have a, a big population growth uh, that has a, a linear kind of uh, growth. And that causes, of course, a bigger need for water, a consumption of water for both uh, potable water, but also agricultural purposes. And therefore, the increases in water withdrawals. At the same time, uh, because of the anthropogenic pressures, we have an increase in water pollution. And because of also climate change effects, which again is an effect because of uh, people, uh, we have more frequent and prolonged droughts. So uh, as we understand, we're moving towards uh, water scarcity at the global level, uh, especially at the local levels it becomes more and more uh, of a common phenomenon, either because of population growth plainly or because of development or a combination of thereof. Um, so what is conjunctive management? Uh, conjunctive water management is an approach, right, to water resource management where surface water, groundwater, and other components of the water cycle are considered as one single source. Therefore, their management should be done in that way. And that would mean that we need to coordinate uh, in order to maximize uh, the benefits from water, not only for the short or medium term, but also for the long term. But conjunctive water management is nothing new, right? I mean, it's not the first time that we're talking about it right now. Uh, we have work that has been done uh, in the past uh, by the World Bank. We had the first publication back in 2010 then UNESCO, along with FAO, uh, and with uh, financing from the GEF and the World Bank, uh, prepared this uh, conjunctive use and management of groundwater and surface water uh, in the mid of the decade, 2015-2016. And lately, uh, a couple of years ago, UNESCO published the conjunctive water management. So nothing really new, right? But there's some new elements that we are looking at. So... Conjunctive water management is intended, uh, and the publication that we have was intended to introduce uh, the joint management of surface and groundwater resources with the objective to familiarize readers with the concept and aiming at water decision makers. But I will get to that a little bit later on. Um, I'm going to move first on what we're saying within the, the definition of conjunctive water management, which is about water cycle and connectivity. Uh, since we are all the professionals in this crowd, I, I think I'm going to brush through this. We are all uh, well aware about the water cycle. So the idea is now 
how are we going to move about conjunctive water management? So at an area-wide level, right, we have to incorporate all water components, which means to explore and analyze the connectivities and exchanges of water, to prevent double counting, to identify promising opportunities, but at the same time, identify hazards of harmful interaction. From another perspective, as far as the activities and techniques at implementation level now in the field, we're looking at the optimal selection of supply uh, of water, so conjunctive use of surface and groundwater. We're looking at resource augmentation and di diversification, basically, of the resources, right? Manage aquifer recharge, water search management, desalination, whether it's uh, brackish groundwater or saline water, recycling of treated wastewater, and of course, improvement in irrigation efficiency. And last but not least, we're looking at environmental controls, right? Uh, restricting groundwater pumping uh, to control surface uh, water environmental flows and ensure that groundwater level controls uh, to prevent flooding. And last but not least, as we saw on the first uh, slide that I had to, is managing uh, wastewater. So how can we put the uh, conjunctive water management paradigm into practice? Uh, we have the groundwater uses, right? We have either great groundwater deficit in overexploited aquifers or groundwater use without excessive adverse impacts. On the first case, we have to understand the groundwater demand, right? We have to look into alternative supplies and try to uh, operationalize MAR to replenish the aquifer. And then on the second case, we are okay. We're on a safe situation as far as management interventions concerns. So at the end, what we want is to have groundwater use without excessive adverse impacts. We want to uh, conduct MAR in order to promote uh, alternative supplies and this way have enough groundwater without any adverse impacts. So example of this could be, like we said before, seawater or brackish water desalination, wastewater reuse or surface water transfer. Now, conjunctive water management, like we said, it was not something new, but it's something also that was not looked at as such in the past. We have hafirs, spite irrigation, and uh, rainfall harvesting, which are not meant primarily for aquifer replenishment, but still are included in MAR overviews nowadays. On the other hand, we have surface water structures, which are built without taking into account the groundwater situation. So when we talk about water, the conjunctive water management, is about that. It's considering all options in an integrated way through common monitoring, assessment, and management. And the new aspect of conjunctive water management is that there's no need to have necessarily this hydraulic connectivity, uh, connectivity between the surface and groundwater bodies, right? But it's the overall water balance in a basin and how you move on different options in order to deal to uh, deal with the, the demand that you have. Now, conjunctive water management is very close to the 3R principle. Uh, I'm sure that most of you are familiar with it, uh, recharge, retain, and reuse. So from a, a, a nature point of view, we have the natural recharge, which can happen from uh, roofs and paved surfaces, uh, which can happen from uh, through the land surface, right? Either from the landfall, uh, runoff and uh, natural infiltration, or we can have from open water bodies with the stream flows and natural infiltration in these cases too. Uh, from another perspective, we do managed recharge, retention and reuse, which can happen through rainfall harvesting and storage tank, groundwater recharge and storage, uh, reuse by wells and springs. We can have also uh, basically this main, uh, two main things, but we can have also soil uh, moisture conservation root zones, and surface water, uh, water storage in reservoirs. Now, as far as managed aquifer recharge techniques concerns, our EGRAC Center had uh, published uh, this summary that brings you the techniques that uh, you can have as far as technology concerns, but also uh, what things you could do. So as far as technology concerns, we have 
uh, the spreading methods, so infiltration ponds, flooding, uh, ditches, or irrigation. Uh, then we can have induced back infiltration, right? Or we can start having wells, right, where we do borehole recharge with deep well uh, injection or shallow wells, right? Uh, then we can have other techniques that uh, refer more to uh, intercepting the water, right? So we have internal modifications with recharge dams, subsurface dams, sand dams, or channel spreading, or we can have a run of harvesting with barriers and bands and trenches. So within that, we have to always understand the, that there is a need for governance provisions, right? Uh, we, we need to, to, to provide for data information and knowledge awareness raising, uh, to check the institutional setup and see if they are adequate and then how they are managed, then to ensure that we have legal and regulatory frameworks. We have to check out our policies. And after the policy, we have to see how we're gonna develop uh, plans to manage the resources. Uh, I'm gonna just uh, show a little bit more graphics about what we spoke about the techniques uh, in order to get a little bit better of understanding. Uh, we have rainwater, rainwater harvesting, uh, which can happen with a rooftop, right? So we harvest the, the rainfall from the rooftop and you can either put it in the ground or you can put it in uh, surface water uh, storage, whether this is plastic or made out of different uh, earth materials, right? Um, we can have the infiltration basins, as we said. Uh, this is an example from the US in Arizona, where basically we uh, utilize big areas. And I was actually uh, recently in uh, South Africa and I was looking at their Atlantis uh, project, which is similar. And, and they're using a, an infiltration basin to basically uh, recharge the ground, uh, the groundwater. And immediately after, they're pumping it for uh, different uses. Uh, similarly, uh, when we're talking uh, about now a different type of uh, recharge, which is mo mainly for storage, also uh, we're looking at injection wells, right? Uh, where we put, uh, but now using uh, pumps, uh, we inject the well in the, the subsurface and then it's ready for extraction. Last but not least, we have the induced bank infiltration, again by uh, guiding uh, the, the water to uh, the banks of the river and then having infiltration to our groundwater, uh, to our aquifer. And then later on, uh, pumping that water for our uses. Now, uh, when we're looking at stopping the water in order to induce the, the, um, uh, the recharge, uh, we can see examples of uh, dam structures, right, where the role is to stop the water from uh, running and then uh, being in an area where you can uh, uh, allow it to infiltrate uh, uh, the subsurface or in this case to remain on the surface and then use it for agropastoralist activities. Now, all this information has been captured uh, for a very long time uh, by our institute in, in Delft, IGRAC, the International Groundwater Resource Assessment center and we have uh, close to 1200 cases right uh, that we have captured um the potential for mar can be mapped now using uh, new technologies this is uh, the case of the merti aquifer but we're doing something similar now in kenya too for the terquel basin uh, and practically what you do is you use uh, remote sensing uh, and you use also uh, the, the EDMs to, to understand the basically slopes and elevations uh, in order to understand better the, the runoff and the speed. And then you look at lithology and soil in order to understand where you could trap the water. Uh, and then uh, by identifying these hotspots, you can develop infrastructure that will help afterwards uh, with your managed aquifer recharge. So, by using modern technology, uh, you can map the potential of MAR and then, as I said, identify the hotspots where you could uh, introduce the infrastructure, whether these are sand dams or other um, uh, techniques that we described before 
to do your managed aquifer recharge. Uh, as I was saying before, we have the latest publication um, that you, you can see here on, on uh, a, a number of studies uh, on uh, managed aquifer recharge, uh, which basically makes the case on, on resilience and sustainability. But things get more complicated when we're looking at transboundary uh, level. Uh, we know that uh, most of our waters are transboundary, but unfortunately, as we are all aware, we have a lot of water treaties for surface water bodies. We have extremely few uh, treaties when it comes to groundwater. And then when it comes to conjunctive water management, so basically to cases where we have treaties where they look both at surface and groundwater, again, the number is a very small one. We have only 52 cases out of the 209 that you have at least on surface water. Now, we have a few cases uh, of, of transboundary contracted water management in Africa. I'm gonna go right uh, to a, a couple of them right after. But uh, we have to understand that aquifer does not have to be transboundary to affect a transboundary river. And again, I will get a little bit more into it in one of my examples, which is uh, the STAS, right? The, the Stamprieta aquifer system. Right, which is shared by Botswana, Namibia, and South Africa. And it's within the Orasicom uh, Basin. Right, We have an international river basin organization there uh, who were talking about water within the basin when uh, most of the part of the basin uh, is using groundwater. So we start working on the Stampriet aquifer system. Uh, we developed a number of uh, tools, uh, data setting and information management systems. But finally, when it came down to the institutionalization of all these, of the management of the uh, shared resource, we managed to establish a multi-country cooperation mechanism within uh, the Groundwater Hydrology Committee of ORASICO, which now facilitates truly the application of IDWRM. I have to say that this is one of the first cases in an IRBO in Africa, and that a number of river basin organizations at least afterwards, like Coca-Com, uh, uh, Zimcom, et cetera, have approached us to discuss on how they can go about it. Similarly, we have uh, the case on, uh, on the Niger uh, uh, River Basin, right, where we're looking at conjunctive water management. And But again, in order to understand a little bit, our, our weakest link is the groundwater, and that's where we need to start paying attention to it a little bit. Uh, from the last report that we had on Indicator 652, which is look at uh, transboundary water, basic international water cooperation, uh, the weakest link is in groundwater. Uh, I'm showing you now a little bit the results on the aquifer components of uh, Indicator 652. And as you see, they don't look promising. Uh, we have very few countries that have been um, able to report even some kind of um, agreement on the shared uh, groundwater resources. Uh, but this is a very good start because we can start uh, the dialogue between countries, right? Uh, and start understanding, uh, making them understand a little bit more of the role of groundwater in this uh, whole uh, conjunctive water management business and IWRM, let's say, and especially at river basin organizations, right? And of course, we can do that by focusing on global legal frameworks that exist. And practically, this is it. Uh, uh, what I wanted to say before I, I close is that uh, beyond the institutional capacities, right, uh, that we need to reinforce to ensure that they're there, the policy environment. We have to start looking also on technology transfer and innovation, uh, and of course, capacity building. A lot of times, uh, especially in Africa, uh, we have a lot of, um, uh, how you call it, um, basically obstacles, which are financial mainly, right? Uh, and um, one uh, of these buyers can be fought by using innovation. Uh, so I will give you an example. 
you can use a, a, an acoustic type of uh, um, uh, monitoring in a, in a operational wells. So then you diminish the need for monitoring wells uh, around the country. That will uh, save you on financings for a, a good groundwater monitoring network. Uh, you have now uh, a cloud solutions that can help with transboundary uh, groundwater resource management, which before they didn't exist. So we have now uh, technology and innovation that can come and help, but still we need to focus on the human capacities, right? And we need, we're still far away from establishing, establishing solid governance and legal mechanisms. So we need basically a depository of good practices that can be shared and that can uh, people can take from uh, different river basins organizations and use them. Um, as closing remarks, just to say that, uh, I'm sorry for the typo here, it's a conjunctive water management, it is primarily a governance issue. We have to understand that. And it depends heavily on the institutional integration and cooperation. And that's why it's a difficult thing to, uh, to do, because we used to have groundwater people talking to themselves, surface water talking to themselves, and uh, not understanding that the basin is your unit and how you're gonna distribute uh, water depends on the demand that you have and that you have to do all, an optimization of the resource distribution. Uh, last, uh, I just wanna say that uh, conjunctive water management can be improved both nationally and interna internationally uh, by including the groundwater component in uh, the RBOs, in the policy documents that we have, in capacity building uh, programs for uh, the authorities, and by setting up proper uh, and solid groundwater monitoring. We need, of course, to raise funds and to do a lot of capacity building. And just to put things into context, uh, I just wanna say that Nile River Basin has a long tradition of contractive water use, especially for the run of, uh, of the water harvesting and retention, uh, which is uh, an experience that we can uh, use elsewhere too, right? At the same time, uh, this experience needs to be integrated and augmented with new scientific insights and technologies. And we are looking forward to cooperating with uh, NBI on that. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much uh, again, Dr. Alexandros, for the very, very brilliant presentation. We have taken us through the case studies on conjunctive use of groundwater and surface water based on UNESCO's projects. You did highlight the importance of conjunctive use, also highlight the, the issues of managed aquifer recharge and the different technologies. You also highlighted some of the situations where conjunctive water management is actually being undertaken, giving an example of the Stampriate Aquifer and Aurascom and the Niger River Basin and also the integration of groundwater and river basin uh, organizations as key in ensuring that you have conjunctive management of groundwater and surface water. We also highlighted the challenge we are having when we are monitoring SDG 6.52, that we don't have information on groundwater, and also ended by indicating to us the importance of investing in groundwater infrastructure so that we can understand the resource and ensure that we manage this resource and of course, also stressing the importance of integrating groundwater and surface water in the institutional arrangements and also cooperation arrangements. So thank you very much. Again, those who may be having questions, comments, put them in the chat. We'll have opportunities to raise them. We move on. I don't know whether Dr. Sebene is already online. Dr. Maha, you are at me uh, when he comes online. And I'm happy to see one of the colleagues, Professor Sif Eridin, happy to see you and have you online. I saw you in the, in the chat there. We're happy to have you again join us. We are going to move to the next presenter. Uh, this is Dr. Shigidi Abdara. He's going to present to us on the development of a watering and groundwater table management system for the Nuri World Heritage archaeological site under UNESCO Khartoum, Sudan. And uh, Dr. Abdara, as a way of introduction, 
He is a senior consultant with a wide range of experience in water resources management, civil engineering with more than 20 years experience in groundwater modeling and resource assessment techniques. He's the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering, Sudan University, Khartoum. Over to you, Dr. Abudara. If you can do your presentation in 10, 12 minutes, we'll be up, we would appreciate. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and I'll do my best, uh, Professor Callis, to uh, finish in time. I'll uh, be giving uh, a quick talk about an example where uh, the issue of uh, absence of conjunctive management can create serious problems to stakeholders in uh, uh, using a case study. And uh, the case study uh, is actually in uh, Sudan. Uh, it's uh, in a Nuri in a Nuri site, and uh, this is a I can, you can see the map of Sudan in here. It can show you the marked in red here the location within Sudan, which uh, where uh, the study case is. And this is a very prominent part of the Nile. It's actually the area in which the Nile, rather than flowing north, is flowing south. So uh, due to the basement complexes in this area, so it's it's. Uh, it's a very prominent feature in the, in the Nile geomorphology. And uh, uh, this area, the town, the Nuri town, uh, is a house or a home to uh, a historic site from the Kushite uh, kingdom. And it contains a number of uh, royal cemeteries that are about 2,400 years old. Uh, this is an aerial uh, photo of showing some of the some of the pyramids. Some of these cemeteries have pyramids, old pyramids, and uh, uh, it's a UNESCO heritage site. Have been declared uh, was one since two thousand and three, uh, and uh, this is some of the pyramids that are failing due to the A. And what you see, this zinc here is the entrance to the one of the Anastasian tomb. And archaeologists have noticed over the past 20 and 30 years that there is, have been a rise in the water table uh, that has been covering the burial chambers. This is uh, a study team inside the, 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 in, in the pyramid. It's cut in the sandstone, and there is actually an uh, ancient uh, staircase cut in sandstone. And you can see as soon as one enters, the burial chambers and the, even the stair uh, the stairs are covered with water, and it has been rising for quite a significant time. The UNESCO was interested in dewatering and understanding why this uh, continuous rise of groundwater is happening. And uh, the study started with gathering data, and this is basically uh, showing the this map on the right here is showing the topography of the area. And uh, we can see uh, this area is the tomb site. And we can see it has a higher altitude. And the, uh, the land actually is sloping towards the river. This is the river Nile in here. And it's also sloping in this direction. So we have so, uh, sloping from up to down from uh, uh, from north to south, actually, in the southwest direction. And uh, it's sloping towards the Nile. And uh, the study started by collecting basic data. And uh, just to explain, to summarize, this is the Merowida, actually, here. It's not far from the site. This is the site. This is the Merowida. And I want you to notice a few things. The river here, that is the Nile, is braided in these areas. And you can see there is a lot of... Uh, uh, of drainage, uh, the, the natural drainage system within the basement complex. These areas are basement complexes. Okay, these are basement complexes. And in here, we do have the beginning of alluvium deposits and uh, sandstone deposits in this area. So this is the beginning of the aquifer, actually. This is the beginning of the aquifer. And just it's in this area, it's a basement complex with a, a drainage, even though there is a limited rainfall in the area. And uh, this, uh, the, the, the catchment area is significant and they do bring in subsurface flow draining into the river. And the river in this 
area of uh, in this region is acting as a natural drain, as a part of course, a part of the natural drain system. Um, okay. Uh, the area, uh, if you are talking about human activities in the area, uh, the area is housed to a number of small communities that uh, use uh, uh, and a number of agricultural projects. The Nuri project, this which is basically takes the the, the from which the name of the of the site comes, the Nuri site, the Nuri village, it's an old village, uh, has an irrigated agricultural project since 1917 irrigating by irrigated by pumping from the river so this is a hundred year old project that has been going on uh being, being continuously uh developed and it uh, in recent years it has an area of about 2000 hectares and in recent years it have seen significant development by the intro by the, the, the construction of Maruida, the introduction of electrical, uh, cheap electricity to the area, and the use of electric pumps to uh, pump water from the river for irrigation. It did witness some intensive irrigation practices, uh, and uh, it did witness also a use of excessive irrigation, whereby uh, it's a subsidy, it was a subs uh, electricity subsidized for farmers, and this led to the fact that there is an over irrigation with irrigation uh, uh, basically being efficiency uh, rem being uh, remarkably reduced. And this is also, I have to remind, this is uh, uh, an old uh, system of irrigation that have a low efficiency uh, in the surface irrigation system, which is inherently inefficient. Uh, or, or has a low efficiency, and then there is over irrigation, which caused the system to be uh, rather uh, inefficient in terms of irrigation. Over time, there has arise been witnesses have uh, uh, some signs of damage to houses have been witnessed in blue areas, and this shows basically uh, some of the output of the results uh, or the findings of the study, which basically has a conceptual model for the project area. We have the river uh, at the low end here, draining uh, as a draining part of the all the excessive water. We have excess water from irrigation into the shallow aquifer, the alluvium aquifer. The shallow alluvium aquifer is underlain by alluvium sandstone. We have also some surf, subsurface flow from the surface runoff flowing from the mountains recharging uh, the aquifer and this is a natural process the aquifer is not is a shallow aquifer it's not an extensive aquifer depths vary from few meters to 20 to 30 meters in some area it's the beginning of the aquifer and in the past actually uh, and we had changes to the morphology of the river uh, due to the operation and change of the the, uh, the water levels in the river due to the operation of uh, Marawi Dam in 2008. So the river uh, stage is became they don't they don't vary as much as they used to before the dam. What eventually happened is that uh, it, uh, even though this had been continuing for a significant amount of time, uh, the amount of excessive irrigation cannot be drained into the river, and this led to the gradual groundwater table rise and which led to the rise of the water table within the Marawi site. And uh, there were signs that this is going to continue. Uh, uh, and uh, there are signs also of houses that have been demolished in some low areas. And uh, uh, so basically what we are talking about is uh, the amount of water that's replenishing the aquifer is much higher than the amount of drainage capacity and this is going to cause a continuous uh, uh, buildup of groundwater uh, levels. Uh, this can have significant consequences of course on the population as was uh, uh, actually found later. We what was what done there was we did conduct a monitoring, we construct a monitoring system using existing wells 
most of them were abandoned wells, which are old wells, which we have identified and used for monitoring. We had to drill some also monitoring wells, so we uh, built a system of monitoring. Monitoring continued for about one year, actually, and there was a significant help from the community. We did incorporate the community in uh, uh, basically the uh, monitoring process, and some of them, these wells were within lands of the people in, in the community, sometimes houses, high areas that are not irrigated, so on. So some of them are in the middle of the fields. And uh, so it uh, eventually, uh, we also had measurements of the daily river state data from the Ministry of Irrigation and Water Resources. And we went on to develop a groundwater modeling using the model, using the collected monitoring data, uh, which was used for the cal model calibration. And uh, we basically estimated that the groundwater level will continue to rise uh, with varying rates, depending on the uh, hydrogeologic properties of the aquifer, uh, with varying from 0.1 meter per year to 0.6 meter per year. And that the water table rises about 0.2 meter per year. And this would continue and uh, until it will slow in time, until there is sufficient gradient, groundwater table gradient, for the water to drain into the river. Of course, the operational management of the river water might help in uh, uh, lowering the water table uh, in the aquifer. Uh, but uh, we did project that uh, depths to groundwater is going to be less than two meters in about 30% of the model area by the end of 2026. And uh, this observation actually was confirmed during the past year uh, with uh, monitoring on the ground. Uh, uh, so so there's going, we are talking about parts of, significant parts of the, of, of the settlement area or of the agriculture area would find problems that they may be water logging, causing uh, demoli uh, house uh, collapsing of houses or residence, uh, problems with sanitation, uh, as surface sanitation using wells is uh, practiced, and also with, of course, crop growth as uh, the water table rise causing clogging, water clogging. Uh, our assignment included basically uh, to the, the design of a uh, uh, a dewatering system for the archaeological site as the, they were interested in uh, considering building archaeological uh, 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 a, a dewatering system to control or dewater the area for future studies and excavations. Uh, it was uh, designed as part of the process and uh, we went on actually after that to try to design a management system, a water management system for all of the Nuri area. Uh, what I would like to emphasize here are just a few points. Uh, what we have witnessed here in the Nuri case is a failure of conjunctive management where surface water was excessively used, leading not to groundwater depletion, actually leading to groundwater table rise and causing significant harmful impacts to the local community, and uh, which could render the area actually uninhabitable if it continues elevated. Uh, this is uh, a result of failure of conjunctive management, absence of ground monitoring systems uh, in the area, and this is show a shortcoming in uh, uh, absence of governance mechanisms in the area, groundwater governance mechanisms because this probably could simply be resolved by me mechanisms such as uh, raising the cost of electricity, such as uh, uh, promoting the use of groundwater for irrigation, such as improving irrigation efficiencies uh, and uh, involving uh, the local community, uh, raising awareness among the local community. So governance, governance has an important role to play in the uh, management, in the proper management of resources, and uh, the conjunctive management of surface and groundwater is essential. If not adequately administered, uh, failure of management could lead to catastrophic results. 
uh, whether being a depletion of resources or problems such as uh, destruction of infrastructure and, habit and human habitats, as in the case of the Nuri site. And uh, with this, I thank you all for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Abdara, for the very, very good presentation you have given us. Really very, very interesting on how you have designed the program on the watering and groundwater table management system. You have highlighted to us how you have determined the sources of groundwater and also addressing the complaints by the stakeholders regarding the rising groundwater levels and also the damage to their homes. You have also indicated to us how you have set up the concept up for conceptual, conceptual model and how you have also established the groundwater monitoring systems, how you have set up the numerical model, which you have used to propose, rem propose remedial action, including the watering system. And of course, you have stressed the importance of engaging the stakeholders for uptaking the results and also the importance of conjunctive use and management. So thank you very much for this presentation. Again, colleagues, uh, feel free to post questions in the chat, comments, but we shall have an opportunity to raise comments at the end of the presentation. So we move on with the next presentation. Uh, this presentation is going to be made by Dr. Maha Abrahami. It is on evaluation of groundwater resources in Khartoum for sustainable management. Dr. Maha probably doesn't need much introduction, but for completeness, I will do so. Dr. Maha is a hydrogeologist and senior researcher in water resources management. Uh, she joined the Nile Basin Initiative in January 2021 as project team lead leader for the GFUNDP Transboundary Groundwater Surface Water Conjunctive Use Project. She, wa she has worked as a senior consultant in capacity building in integrated water resources management for various national and regional entities. So Dr. Maha, over to you. For your presentation. Thank you. Dr. Maha, if you are ready, you can start your presentation. Yes, Over thank you, you, Dr. Kalis. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this presentation is on the meeting the demand for domestic water in Khartoum metropolitan city. Khartoum is composed of three cities. Uh, it, it is a triangular, a metropolitan city made up of Khartoum North to the east, and then Khartoum, the one between two Niles in the center, and Umdurman, which is a historical city towards the left. You have the blue Nile on your right hand side of the picture, the white Nile on your left hand side, and then you have the major Nile on top of the photo. Uh, as I said, Khartoum is considered the biggest um, metropolitan city in Sudan, as it has been heavily populated by um, residents, according to Sudan Household Survey. Most than 25% of the Sudanese population is located in Khartoum. And according also to the Sudan Household Survey, 5% of the inhabitants are in the urban areas, 10% in the second class areas, and 85% are located in the third class residential areas. Uh, Khartoum is 
supplied for water supply from two sources, surface water. Uh, there are many water works and treatment plants in, uh, located in Khartoum, Khartoum North, and Enum Durman. Also, it is supplied from groundwater from boreholes that are distributed uh, within the three um, areas. Uh, as you can see from the geologic map of Khartoum, it is mainly a flatland covered by Eulian sand from quaternary sediments. Uh, along the Nile uh, banks, there is the alluvial deposits of the recent um, uh, and then there are some outcrops towards the north and, and the east uh, from the Cambrian and uh, era. For uh, climate, Khartoum uh, is uh, receiving rain during the three rainy season, the three months of the rainy season, starting June, July, August, with the peak being in August. And then it reduces towards September and October. And uh, the temperature gets reduced towards the winter time that starts uh, October, November, December, and January, uh, while the heat increases towards the months before the rainy season uh, with March, April, and May. Uh, the hydraulic conductivity is represented by these uh, graphs uh, where you can see along the Nile in Umdurman to the west, uh, the hydraulic conductivity of the groundwater is very reduced because of the continuous sedimentation uh, with the fine silts, whereas uh, on the other side, which is Khartoum North, hydraulic conductivity is um, is of various uh, values due to the lithophysic change as uh, River Nile is also a meandering river in, a in, in addition to the running stream, seasonal running streams. Uh, the area of Khartoum between two Niles is having also the same setup where you have along the, the Blue Nile um, the, the hydraulic conductivity is high, but towards the White Nile, the hydraulic conductivity is low, and it gets reduced uh, as you move away from the Nile, where you have the um, the accumulation of the silt becomes uh, reduced. Um, the River Nile water quality is generally alkaline uh, with um, very low electrical conductivity. It increases during the flood season. The Nile water is usually neutral to slightly alkaline. Uh, with total hardness range is uh, from 40 to 90, that is not much. And uh, the calcium magnesium contents are usually higher than the sodium potassium ratios because uh, the water type of the Blue Nile is usually calcium magnesium, where the water type of the White Nile is sodium potassium. Um, nitrates are of low content, uh, especially in the White Nile, where it is of uh, somehow increased content along the Blue Nile. And that is referred to uh, anthropological reasons where more urea fertilized fertilizers are used on that area because of agricultural schemes. Uh, the groundwater types in Khartoum, as I said, you have more sodium potassium towards the White Nile and calcium magnesium towards uh, the uh, Blue Nile with TDS values of 100 up to 230 away from the Nile till it reaches uh, 500, sometimes 1,500 away from the Nile towards the inner part of uh, Khartoum between two Niles. Uh, the main water types, the hydrochemical processes in Khartoum state either dissolution of carbonates, uh, this is for the groundwater, or dissolution of sulfates and chlorides. 
Um, usually we find the carbonates along the blue Nile and the main Nile while the sulfates and chlorides towards the white Nile. Uh, we had a, a model developed to see how we can use the two sources, the groundwater and the surface water to supply Khartoum big city. And then we have uh, basic simplifications or assumptions uh, included in the model. Uh, that is the impermeable boundaries of the side and bottom of the model flow region. And then we use the well pumping data network of canals and drains of surface water is placed in the model by a simplified rectangular network. And then the aquifer used in the model of the three locations in Khartoum state is using or assuming unconfined homogeneous isotropic layers uh, using one single layer for water bearing formations for the aquifer. And we use the rainfall recharge of the aquifer is uniformly distributed through the whole study area during the months of August, September, and October. And we use 10% of the average annual rainfall. Uh, the observation wells used were the piezometers uh, in Umdurman, Khartoum, and Bahri. The, the, the model was run and um, we used uh, different stress periods and uh, we run the model up to uh, 2050 to see what are the changes going to be. And then many scenarios were developed. The results of the model were uh, the stoppage of the flow well of the, of the few wells did not change the discrepancy values and have no significance. If you stop 20 of the working wells, that showed very high discrepancy value and deficit in the water balance. The pumping of wells increases the river leakage towards the aquifers to recharge them, but without overdrafting. The stop of pumping reduces the river leakage towards the aquifers, and then it stops replenishing them. With continuous abstraction at low levels, water levels go down, which causes depletion of the water due to weak river leakage. Uh, wells are to be pumped at the abstractions showed in the model as maximum limit to ensure the recharge of the aquifer. And then wells are to be put out of work, out of the <laughs> network, according to a working plan to avoid drop of water levels. Because we have seen that if uh, the wells get stopped, then there is water level rise in some areas of Umdurman and a problem of rising water in houses occurs. And in the same time, at areas where you don't operate the wells, water doesn't leak from the Nile River to replenish the aquifers. So there should be a work plan where you operate the wells accordingly and to manage the water levels to maintain um, the supply and at the same time control the water uh, levels in the aquifers. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Maha, for this brilliant presentation. You introduced us to Khartoum for those who are not familiar about the setup of Khartoum. I think you have taken us through also taken us through the geology of Khartoum state, large the sedimentary aquifer formations. You also highlighted us the distribution of different water quality parameters, and also also indicated areas where some parameters are high. For example, you talked about nitrates being high around the Brunei reduced fertilizer use. You also introduced us really how the groundwater types are distributed and also the processes leading to that. Modeling to determine the flow patterns and also presenting the recharge mechanisms and also the interaction between groundwater and surface water and how to operate the wells to ensure that we manage the water resources in the spirit of conjunctive use and management. So thank you very much again for this presentation. We continue 
with our presentation. We are going to listen to the next presentation by Dr. Nigate Fenta. It is on hydrogeochemical processes and groundwater evolution, the complex geologic, complex volcanic highlands, and alluvial lacustrine deposits, Upper Brunei, Ethiopia. And Dr. Nigeta holds a PhD in uh, geology, hydrogeology from Ghent University and an MSc degree in hydrology and water resources from IHE Delft, the Netherlands. He's currently working as an assistant professor of hydrogeology at Bahirda University. Fent has been designing and coordinating several national and regional research projects and published articles in high-ranking peer-reviewed journals, has been teaching and advising MSc and PhD students at both Bahirda and Ghent universities. Before he became a lecturer, he was involved in many water resources and geotechnical investigation. Over to you, Dr. Nigeta, for your presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for the Nile Basin Initiative for organizing such kinds of uh, forum. Uh, are you hearing me? Yes. All right. Um, if you can put in a full presentation mode. Is it not? Is it not in the presentation mode? No. Yes. All right. This from my side. Yes, now it is okay from my yes. side. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you uh, for the, my topic of presentation is hydrogeochemical process and the groundwater evolution in the Lake Tana Basin. And uh, uh, the study area is in the, located in the Upper Blue Nile Basin, which is uh, Lake Tana Basin. And the area, the entire basin area is about 15,000 square kilometer. And out of this, 3,060 kilometer square is covered by uh, Lake Tana Basin. And this is one of the source of Blue Nile. And the basin has an, an, an average annual rainfall of 1,400 millimeter. And it is a monomodal type of rainfall is a very common in that, in that specific area. And the geology, when it comes to the geology of the area, dominantly it's covered by volcanic rocks. Um, and some part in the lowlands is covered by uh, some alluvial um, deposits. And the objective of investigation of this site is one, to uh, uh, investigate the geochemical process controlling the groundwater chemistry uh, of the area. And then to identify a source of recharge using integrated use of water chemistry and isotope data, isotope stable isotope data mainly. And to achieve the, our goals, we follow different methods. One is uh, first one is data collection. We have collected about 275, 73 samples from deep well, shallow well, spring, hand well, reverse, and rainwater. And 43 samples are uh, collected from secondary source. And during sampling, we follow the standard procedures like pumping for sampling is a very common practice to avoid uh, contamination. And using, for example, for pumping, either using submersible pump or surface pump. And using uh, balers also used for sampling to collect samples from hand wells, I mean, shallow depths. And in the field, we have measured uh, in, situ, in situ measurements like pH, Electrical conductivity, temperature, and dissolved oxygen content using using a multi-parameter multi um, instrument. And when we are sampling for uh, major ion analysis, we do uh, cation analysis. For example, for samples for cation analysis, we do a filtration using uh, 0.45 micrometer membrane to avoid uh, uh, some uh, ingredients. And we are certified with nitric acid to avoid further uh, reaction. So, and before sampling, we do uh, rinse bottles three times before sampling, also to avoid uh, contamination. And we have polyethylene bottles for isotope and uh, chemistry data sampling. When you come to the lab analysis, major ions are analyzed in the laboratory of applied geology and hydrogeology at Ghent University, but uh, isotope analysis was done at beta analytic in USA. And so when you come to the data analysis, we use statistical methods, a graphical representation using aquachem and geochemical modeling using Frexy. 
And when it comes to result and discussion section, first of all, we did a correlation matrix, a correlation matrix among 11 parameters. And when you see the, these uh, bold lines are the correlation, uh, correl correlation degree. For example, sodium is highly correlated with uh, electrical conductivity and the TDS because this is the main contributing, sodium is the main contributing factor for the, for, for the high TDS and C value or the presence of TDS or C value in that for water. And there are, for example, here, magnesium is highly correlated with uh, sodium as well because it can be, the source rock for sodium and magnesium can be from the same source. And here you can see the nitrate is highly correlated with uh, chloride. It can indicate that there are some wells, some water, I mean, some water which is uh, already polluted by uh, anthropogenic activities. After doing a correlation analysis with the uh, with the hierarchical classification, you have 300, 301 samples. So it is very difficult to uh, interpret separately. We have to make a, a grouping using hierarchical classification system. And we have got about seven, seven groups of uh, water samples. And we analyze using uh, a stiff diagram to identify what type of water is in that in that groups. And finally, we found the young water, which is calcium bicarbonate of the type of water, and the most evolved water was sodium bicarbonate type of water. And uh, this is, indicates as 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 the uh, area is covered by uh, uh, silicate group of mineral rocks, silicate group of rocks like uh, um, uh, volcanic rocks. So the evolution is uh, mainly been due to silicate dissolution and the calcite precipitation, along mainly silicate dissolution. And to identify also the groundwater evolution and the systems where we, we, we do, we test also using stability diagram uh, by using the activity of potassium and uh, silicate, I mean silica. And we have tested that the group of samples are falling on the carinite group. And mainly on the equilibrium line of microclean, some, some minerals, some, some water samples, following the equilibrium line between microclean and kaolinite. That means they are stable here. But uh, the water is highly, I mean, kaolinite is stable in this water system, but microclean is not. It means circuit group of minerals is still dissolving. Yeah? When you come to this one, uh, sodium and, uh, sodium and uh, hydrogen ion activities with the silica group, and we have seen that also most of the group of samples are falling on the kaolinite and the Montemor sodium montemorite group. And he, this means this uh, kaolinite and sodium montemorite are stable in this water system, but albite is not stable. Albite is further dissolving into this formation. And the same thing uh, using calcium versus the calcium hydrogen activity with silicate group of minerals. And we have seen that some of the, most of the minerals, I mean, the water samples are falling on uh, calcium montemorlonite and then kaolinite group of minerals. So that means this kaolinite and montemorlonite are stable in this water system, but anortite is not stable. That means there will be further dissolution and forming the water chemistry of the, the, the water. And we try to test also the bicarbonate versus uh, versus pH value, and we are and we have seen that some of the deep wells, small number, at least three deep wells are showing that there are high amount of bicarbonate uh, and there is low amount of I amine mean, acidic in the acidic zone. That means this area is getting huge amount of maybe bicarbon dioxide from other sources. That means that dissolves huge amount of bicarbonate and the pH value is low. But whereas the others are dominant, I mean the water samples are falling just uh, like this. That means bicarbonate and pH is increasing in a parallel way. And this is the source of, uh, this one is aluminum silicate dissolution. That means bicarbonate is increasing as well as pH is also increasing. And we try to test also bicarbonate versus saturation index of carbon dioxide. And we have seen that uh, we have three groups of uh, three zones, I mean, some of the water types that are getting carbon dioxide from atmospheric carbon dioxide because the zone is beyond this one is atmospheric so sources from carbon, atmospheric carbon dioxide. But this zone, they are getting carbon dioxide from uh, carbon dioxide from the atmospheric as well as the soil zone. But beyond this one, there is another source of uh, carbon dioxide, which may, makes a high high saturation index in the, in the carbon dioxide zone. 
Uh, when you come to the stable isotope signatures, we have also analyzed the samples for isotope stable isotope signatures, and uh, normally we have developed a uh, global meteoric water line, the John Rollerman, and the second one is local meteoric water line at Addis Ababa. And we have also developed our own local meteoric water line at the Lake Tana Basin, and we have seen that most of the samples are falling uh, along along the local meteoric water line at Addis Ababa station. That means most of the water does not infiltrate the water. Most of the water infiltrate without undergoing further further evapotranspiration. I mean evaporation. And there are some waters which is highly depleted. This means this water is maybe recharging somewhere in a longer period of time. And I, this map shows you the spatial variation of uh, O18 values. And when you come to the table, uh, this table, you can see that the mean value of uh, O18 and uh, deuterium value for deep well, shallow well, and up to hundred uh, well. When you go from this line to this one, the O18 value is highly in, in, I mean, um, enriched because hundred wells well, the waters from under wells can be uh, highly evaporated. Maybe it's supposed to be evaporation, but the deep wells is not that much if, uh, exposed to evaporation. Uh, and also, we, not, we need to check the uh, carbon 13 value with bicarbonate. And we have seen that most of the, sample, the water samples are falling in this line. That means these water samples are getting water from carbon dioxide and soil, soil atmospheric zone, whereas this one could get another source of carbon dioxide, it can be from the magmatic source, be why we say magnetic source. This uh, carbon dioxide, I mean, by, as you see, uh, carbon 13 value is highly enriched at this point, which is similar to, similar to even above of the uh, carbon dioxide uh, from magmatic sources. When you come to the last uh, thing, the summary, we have two types, we identify two types of water, recharge water and discharge water. When you use the recharge water, it consists of fresh carbon dioxide, sorry. Uh, fresh carbon dioxide, calcium bicarbonate water type with uh, tedious value less than 3,000 milligrams per liter. And the isotopic composition of this water fall near to the local meteoric water line, which suggests that recharge is more uh, modern precipitation without significant evaporation. And there is low rock water interaction and there is short residence time. But the, uh, when you see the carbon-13 value, it indicates that the principal source of carbon dioxide is from the combination of atmospheric and soil carbon dioxide, as you can see the value. But when you come to the discharge water, we have two types of discharge water. One is highly brackish, the other is uh, uh, diluted water. The brackish water, uh, they have TDS value greater than 3,000 milligram per liter, and they are uh, depleted with respect, respect to uh, O18 and enriched with respect to uh, carbon 30 values. And that means they are, the source is deep system and open to the flux of carbon dioxide other than atmospheric and soil carbon dioxide. It can be a magmatic source. And this is enriched with also carbon uh, 13 value and depleted in O18, indicating highly evolved groundwater. That means this water is uh, a little bit highly, uh, the residence time is long. So strong rock interaction and has a long residence time. And the other uh, the recharge, discharge water is uh, sodium bicarbonate type of water. And the value of O18 is between this one and this one. And uh, carbon 30 value is also there. Is also here, carbon 30 value is also more uh, enriched. And the source can be from also a deep source. This is, uh, thank you. This is the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Nigate, for the brilliant presentation. Uh, you have taken us through really the geochemical processes controlling groundwater chemistry and also helped us to identify the sources of recharge using various techniques. You took us through the sampling protocol, the lab analysis, data analysis, and also presented the results. You also highlighted the different water types and also the different hydrogeochemical processes and how groundwater is evolving. The use of hydrochemistry and isotope techniques, stable isotopes and carbon-13, and also the identification of the types of water, recharge water and discharge water. Again, the application of the different techniques has been well, well elaborated. Thank you very much. Again, colleagues, any questions you can post in the chat, but also you can 
uh, write them down and raise them during the discussions. We move on to the next presentation. We are going to hear from Dr. Taye Arimayo. He's going to present to us a, a, a basin characterization and determination of hydraulic connectivity for transboundary aquifers of the Horn of Africa using integrated methods. As a open production, Dr. Taye holds a PhD degree in water resources engineering and management, specializing in groundwater management. He holds an MSc with a distinction from International Institute of Aerospace Survey and Earth Sciences, ITC, University of Trent, the Netherlands. He has been working in various countries on work related geological resources management and environmental geology in Ethiopia, he has had short term assignments in various countries within the region and outside and is an assistant professor at the Ethiopian Institute of Water Resources at Sababa University. Dr. Taye, the floor is yours for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kalis, for the kind introduction and also NBI for the invitation you offered me. Uh, uh, um, as you can see, my presentation is uh, uh, on the issues of the Horn of Africa and <clears throat> actually the groundwater surface uh, interaction. Uh, actually, the, as you can see uh, from the map on the left and the right side, uh, the Horn of Africa, is, uh, the African countries almost have a shared water resources. Uh, by chance, we are the uh, same countries for most of the surrounding countries. Actually, we claim that 97% of our surface water is flowing out, uh, but uh, we don't. We say a little about the groundwater condition, but uh, we assume that uh, the groundwater uh, is also flowing out radially to the neighboring countries. Uh, from the highlands of Ethiopia. But the problem is uh, how do they behave when they are flowing out radially out of Ethiopia? And how does this 97% of the surface slope flow in, ends up when it reaches uh, into the neighboring countries? So this is the issue that uh, need to be, uh, I want to address. So there is a sharp drop and complete disappearance of uh, the perennial flows that I have seen during my, actually this research is based on a research which is completed seven years ago and the, uh, the observations, the various observations I had and uh, the neighboring countries and elsewhere. So the, the, we, I, have, uh, I have seen a, a shad drop and complete disappearance of perennial flows in all the, areas surrounding Ethiopia. Uh, I have measured about 15 metric per second from three streams. As I go downstream, I couldn't get a, a drop of water for sampling purpose. That means this water is disappearing somewhere. So uh, they, uh, they pass through the, the you can see it, here, the, the, uh, the, uh, the flow goes out of the country. They pass through the different structures uh, or different types of rocks. In the east, there is this karstified formation that takes away the surface flow into the deep karst cavities. So eventually, it goes to the deep seated high slope gradient basement. Uh, area and it makes it unrecoverable. unrecoverable. Uh, and there is also uh, rivers like uh, the big river like Awash as it enters, as it crosses the structures, the Red Sea structures, the other structures, there is a sharp decrease in the in flows in uh, its annual flow. 
So the, most of the decrease happen during the low flow season as the flow is retarded by the structures. That means this low flow flows from radiated out of Ethiopia are retarded and, and subjected to disappearance into the deep structures. If you just see, uh, just look into what's happening in the Western Ethiopia, this is uh, on the west, we are, uh, the, is the upland. Uh, in the upland, there is uh, this uh, formation, which where, where we have only thin layer of uh, recent sediments and some amount of uh, trap basal tertiary volcanics. But as we just go westward, we enter into the continental sediments that are kilometers of that have kilometers of thickness, like the Melu, the Mughlad, and it goes like that and joins the Mesozoic African Rift system. This Mesozoic African Rift system sits of are connected and they are filled with continental sediment that are not allowing saturation of the groundwater system, not only in the along the Mesozoic Rift system, also in the Ethiopian in the Machar and Sud wetlands, there is no saturation. We don't see that kind of saturation. And the Central African shear zone here is a very, uh, ten, it is tens of uh, kilometers wide. It also guides the flow system, which is radiating from the highlands of the Horn of Africa towards the west. That is the finding that we made uh, seven years ago. So we have made some, uh, we have analyzed the geological, structural, uh, and also we have, we have applied remote sensing. What is lacking uh, in uh, addressing hydrological and hydrogeological issues is we don't we we normally uh, overlook the geological studies and the regional geological studies. Where our studies are mostly bounded by the political boundaries. So this limits us to see. The regional influences of the hydro, the the regional structures and the uh, uh, the regional uh, the mega aquifers. So uh, we used uh, hydrochemical analysis and isotope analysis to determine what is going on really. Uh, so uh, about 363 samples were collected. Uh, also about 20 270 water quality data were analyzed. We also analyzed. Uh, some radioactive uh, isotope signatures of the different waters, including groundwater, surface water, rainwater, springs, and all, all those kinds of water to determine uh, the source of rainfall, the nature of the groundwater system, how it is uh, connected with the groundwater, uh, with the surface flow. There is a huge amount of flow in the western uh, part of Ethiopia, and why that is not what that is happening? Why that kind of flow is not happening in the other part of the country was uh, the, some of the questions that uh, that we are asking ourselves. So, if you see here, uh, this is a, one of the big rivers, the Baro River. It just cuts through the the. Uh, perpendicularly aligning aligned sink lines. And it's just cut through those synclinal, uh, anticlinal uh, hills, and it take, uh, uh, following the Aden and the, the different fault system. But as it processes the, the different sink lines and the, the uh, formations that are uh, aligned across the flow system, it sharply drops its flow. What's amazing here is the, the basement gradient. The basement gradient is very sharp. And uh, the one, if it uh, end up sinking, it is really unrecoverable. It follows the deep gradient to lost into the tens of kilometers of, uh, of up, to, up to tens of kilometers of continental sediment. Uh, this is uh, what we also saw from the, uh, uh, the, the isotope analysis is the, the groundwater system in the Western Ethiopia is a, a, very, a very modern water to make it vulnerable to subtle climate change. That means even the flow duration curve between the 
the hydrograph between Wales and uh, 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 the Barrow River is almost similar. There, there is only four months of lag. That means the groundwater system, even the river system is highly dependent on the uh, groundwater system where the groundwater system is all by itself is highly vulnerable to subtle climate change because we don't have enough aquifer on that part of the western fringe. The aquifers are somewhere behind, behind in the plateau. In the plateau, we have, we have a very thick trap flood basalt and trap series, and we also have these narrow valleys that can be used for storage. The plateau, which is filled with flood basalt, at some places is incised up to the basement rock to give a, a valley, a narrow valley as high as a kilometer deep. So these are, when I see the, the East African, the Horn of Africa as a system, I see, I see them as, as a single hydrologic unit because we have a storage here, a very conducive storage and narrow valleys. And there are the whole uh, area surrounding Ethiopia is a kind of plain, which is vulnerable to flood, to drought, to the diminishing rainfall, and all kinds of calamities exist there, while these dry open valleys are there for to act a reservoir. So this is a, the flow pattern at, as it goes from the Ethiopian highlands to the west. So it ends up, ends up in these continental sediments and it will, will, will never recover it. So if you see here, this is Turmit in Chad. So from the Ethiopian highland up to Turmit, the continental sediments are very much connected and saturation is and never be attained. So if you just see the cross section, the north south cross section here, you can see how hundreds, I mean, you can find hundreds of post potential reservoir sites where we can store the surface flow, recharge our groundwater, and enhance the base flow of the rivers just by managing here in a narrow valley where evaporation is less. So uh, my uh, recommendation here is uh, Alexandro has talked about uh, conjective use. My suggestion is to have a conject conjective management of surface and groundwater and a joint management of our resources as a, a common uh, resource so that we uh, address our joint problem like food insecurity, flood and whatever calamities that are happening in the Horn of Africa. Uh, this is uh, shortly what I prepared for the 10, uh, the 10 minutes presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Tai, for this very good presentation. Indeed, you have demonstrated the importance of working across our borders. And you didn't indicate how groundwater, rather water froze and how it disappears in some locations. And we need to trace its movement. Also, you have indicated the challenges we are, have, we are having when we work uh, across uh, within our borders without working across the borders. That leads failure for us to identify how the groundwater resources are actually flowing and interconnected with the surface water. But the work you have done has really helped to get us to look at the resource holistically at the regional level. And in your presentation, you have also indicated the importance of using different methods, hydrogeological methods, isotope techniques, and also well monitoring data. And the results you have presented, again, you summarize indicating that the Horn of Africa is hydrologically, hydrogeologically, and ecologically connected. So we need to manage this as one new system. Also indicated the huge potential that may exist in various parts of the Horn of Africa to tap into the resources that are available. 
And you concluded by indicating the importance of joint management and planning so that we can take advantage of these huge resources. Again, thank you very much. We move on to our last presentation before we go into the discussions. Uh, we are going to listen to Dr. Tom Ogwang. He's going to present to us on the topic Indigenous People and Rivals Around Kagera Shared Aquifer. And Dr. Ogwang is a lecturer in the Faculty of Interdisciplinary Studies at the Mbarai University of Science and Technology in Uganda. He holds a PhD in the political economy of natural resources from the University of Groningen, the Netherlands, a PhD in political science from Mackey University, Master of Arts in International Relations and Diplomatic Studies from Mackey University, a postgraduate diploma in the teaching in institutions of higher learning from Uganda Matters University, and a Bachelor of Arts in Environment Studies from Mackey University. His research interests are in indigenous people stroke communities, and press attachment, social impacts of oil and gas projects and extractive industries. I would like now to invite Dr. Guang to present to us. Over to you, Dr. Guang. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kalis. I will be requesting the secretary to project my work, and I will not... Uh, I will use audio because my internet connectivity is slow. So basically, um, this work being the last, I think it was well uh, timed because I don't have any models to, to demonstrate to you. I don't have any, I've been hearing all the presentations that are talking about models over time and this and that. But as a background, uh, this work was, um, a result of a consultancy which I did for NBI, um, looking at the social aspects of water along cross border um, within the within the aquifers that we have in Uganda. So I'm saying the demand for surface water across many basins in the world is growing, as has been presented by many colleagues uh, before me, and um, there's the call for alternative sources of water. And one of the targets for this alternative source is groundwater, which is not uh, very well um, tapped by many developers. Um, the indigenous people, basically, if I'm to define uh, indigenous people, uh, in Uganda, we have two major groups who are considered to be indigenous people based on their lifestyle, which is very different from the rest of the communities. And in that aspect, we say when we're talking about access to groundwater and usage to water, um, these people are mostly affected in a negative way, as we'll see in the next slide. Um, we have two main groups based in Kagera and the Elgon subregions, which are basically predominantly an agricultural area or society, and therefore the need for water is actually high compared to the other places. Now, because of their perceived low social and economic status in society, indigenous people have got limited access to issues of governance and management of natural resources. This includes water. And therefore, if they have limited access to governance and management of natural resources, it also means they have limited access to adequate groundwater. This is basically the main argument. Just a small, for us in social sciences, we try to talk by presenting what is on the ground. This is one of the, the, the photos I took during that uh, exercise in Kagera subregion. These are the, the these are the Batua. The Batua are the indigenous people who are basically evicted from their natural habitat where they used to stay, uh, to pave way for um, a game park and, uh, and, and, and a natural forest reserve uh, in, in, in Western Uganda, bordering Uganda and Kenya. So I just 
took these pictures, which we'll be seeing, to show you what it means to be an indigenous person. And most of them, as we'll see, uh, they live a life which is considered by all standards a poor life and denying them access to these natural resources, especially water, is a question of human rights um, issues that I will be presenting along the way. Next slide. Now, um, this is some of the governance challenges that we are talking about. It affects the indigenous people because they lack the voice. This is a well which was constructed by one of the NGOs. And once the well got dried up, there was no alternative which was put in place for these people. And because they don't have voice, and by voice we're talking about representation in the local councils, at the national parliament, we don't have any, 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 any indigenous person, considered indigenous person by all the nations who are represented in some of these institutions where decisions are made. And once they're not represented, it means that their voices cannot be heard and then the source allocation cannot be adequately appropriated to cater for the needs of these people. So this was one of the, the wells, um, the taps which dried up and um, no one is, is real concerned. The next, Um, this, I don't know whether the, 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 the photo is very clear. If it's not clear, this is a boy and a girl. They are tapping water from uh, the water which is flowing from the, from the mountains and they're using, um, they're using a banana, banana stem. A banana stem is made up of layers. So you cut the layer, one of the top layers, and then you insert uh, in the hole where water is flowing. And that is a way of so this is the kind of life uh, these people live because they're using their indigenous knowledge anyway to to see amid this, um, the challenges that 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 they face in as far as uh, natural resource management and accessibility, especially water, is concerned. Next slide. Uh, this is um, one of the meetings we had. This is now in Eastern Uganda, uh, where we have a group called the Benet. The Benet were actually uh, displaced from the slopes of Mount Elgon. And I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have the map. I should have done this for you. But Dr. Maha told me the presentation is 10 minutes. So um, a group of Indigenous people along the slopes of Mount Elgon um, were having a focus group discussion in one of the schools uh, within their communities there. So an old man who represents them as the elder was giving a speech and I thought I should share this with you uh, because it, it forms the basis of um, what the, the, the challenges that they face. And most of these challenges cut across from the east to west they have similar issues affecting them in as far as uh, the management of these natural resources and accessibility is concerned the next slide please now the gist of my presentation here is best to look at the challenges affecting indigenous people in as far as um accessing groundwater is concerned. Uh, the first thing that I have to say, maybe before I go into the details of this, is that these people, especially the Kagera Basin, they are scattered since they were displaced from the forest, 1992, 90, around 91, 92, they are scattered all over. They, they, don't, they don't have a place to call a home. And because they don't have a place to call a home, they are not having that unified voice as a group. And this is because they lack representation, as I said in, 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 the, earlier, uh, in the earlier slides. It's, it's a challenge to them. The other second challenge is the question of isolation or accessibility and limited facilities. 
the life they lead, if you go there and see the life they lead, the life is miserable. They live a miserable life. They're isolated. The they accessing them as a group is not very easy because they're scattered all over. This is in Kagera Basin. The other side of, of Mbale or the, the Eastern region is the road to where they stay is basically they're on top of the, the mountains, on the slopes of the mountains. And um, getting hold of them is not very easy. But also most important, they, they, they lack uh, facilities. We're talking about taps, we're talking about those boreholes that, of course the boreholes cannot be drilled in, high, in, uh, in highlands, but in places where people have voices, they have um, other alternative water sources which are tapped and, and given to them. So that, that makes uh, this group really uh, to, to face a lot of uh, challenges in as far as accessing those resources are concerned. Um, the other challenge is basically uh, the lack of stroke loss of esteem. They don't have they don't they, they don't have esteem. They have low self esteem. They are seen when you see them walking, they walk as if they don't belong to that society. This is what I observed when I was in the field. And when you talk to them they need to get like permission from other people to say what they want to say because they feel after talking to you, most likely they may not be given uh, maybe work or food or whatever. They feel the, the, the way they, they behave exhibits all indicators of low self-esteem. They don't believe in themselves and that is a big problem. Because of low esteem, they cannot address the issues affecting their welfare. They cannot address the issues affecting the challenges that they face in accessing groundwater or even water in general. Because what will happen is when they go to any water source, they indic the, the local people who are, <coughs> sorry, who are considered to be um, the inhabitants or the owners, the rightful owners of the place will first have to get water before these people uh, get water. There are cases where uh, when they are growing water and they see the local residents coming, they first have to leave for them space to get water. Then they will start growing water when these people have managed to related to uh, low self-esteem. But most importantly, this group of people, especially in Kagera Basin, they are used as a source of cheap labor. The amount of money that they get in relation to the work that they do is exploitation. That's the best word to describe this. That if you want cheap labor, you have to get a mutua uh, who is going to do that job for you. Sometimes they actually kept in gardens for months. They take for them food there. So they're supposed to scare away the animals from eating the food in the garden until the harvest is done. And then this will get back to the other communities. So that kind of treatment or that kind of job, no one the ordinary people cannot accept to be in a garden for one month or for three weeks before they cross uh, to the communities where there are people. So that is, that is really a, a, a very big, big <clears throat> challenge. Then the second last point, I think, is the question of elite capture. We have had a number of organizations. Some have done a good job. They bought for them land, but they have refused to give them the land title. And uh, others have used the plight of these people as a way of making money, which to me is a bit uh, unfortunate. But because they don't have the voice, because they don't have representation, because they have low uh, self-esteem, nothing. They, they cannot even question these NGOs. They cannot question any person. What they want are earnouts for survival for today and tomorrow. And that is it. So. You don't expect such a group 
when it comes to discussing about resource allocation, which affects their welfare, which affects their lives, to really come up and say, look here, you are exploiting us, nothing. So this category of people are really finding it hard or they're surviving the hard way. And Dr. Wang, yes, yes, okay. Doctor, can you hear me? Yes, I was wondering whether you are done because I was not hearing you. Oh, no, I'm um, actually on my last point. I don't know whether you heard me when I was explaining about elite capture. Yes, yes, so if you can wind up. Okay, okay. My, my last point is what they call systematic discrimination and marginalization. Uh, they have a feeling that uh, they have been systematically discriminated and marginalized in a had to this wider conference. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Guang, for the presentation. Again, I write to ask why we need to conjunctively manage and develop surface and groundwater resources for the people. And you highlighted the importance of water to the indigenous people. other services you clearly highlighted why we need to look at them as a special group because they have limited representation we need to raise their voices raw self-esteem we need to build their capacity so that they can bargain and of course also avoiding exploiting them in whatever we do as elite but also this, uh, avoiding discriminating against them so thank you very much again for this presentation highlights the importance of looking at the people we serve so that we can meet their needs now and in the future. So colleagues, this marks the end of our presentations. We have about 10, 12 minutes to the end of this session. So I want to open the floor for comments, questions. And when you raise your comment or question, you can indicate the presenter you are targeting. Or if you have a general comment or question, then you can also indicate that. So feel free to post in the chat, but also you can put up your hand and then we'll give you an opportunity to actually raise your comments. I see we already have Mohammed Sali Yassin. You can take the floor and raise your comments or questions. Over to you, Mohammed. <coughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Kalist. Uh, and uh, uh, you hear me, Commissioner? I will hear you very well. Do you hear me, Commissioner? Yes, yes. yes. I hear you. I imagine others are hearing Hello? you. So go ahead. Uh, good. Thank you very much. Uh, my question goes to Dr. Maha on the uh, uh, quality evaluation of what uh, groundwater evaluation in Khartoum, in urban Khartoum. She affirms that for the last 65 years, there is no change in the water chemistry. Despite of the growing population, she indicated here population in 2008, but we are in 2023. And as far as I know that Khartoum state uh, demography has grown significantly. And also without erecting any uh, proper uh, sewer system and, uh, and people are uh, siphoning their, uh, their, their things directly on the groundwater by 
digging siphons. In addition to that, also the industries are discharging uh, more or less without any significant treatment of their waste and so on, as well as the agricultural schemes. So the, uh, the quality of the water should have some change during this. So I'm wondering how come she is saying that there is no any change. Uh, when she refers to the chemistry, maybe she she intends the HT, uh, HTO of the, of the water, but uh, I'm, I'm talking about the quality of the water, the suspended, and if they are, if they are heavy, met, uh, heavy minerals, heavy metals there, or uh, if any significant pollutants in the, in the groundwater. Another question goes also to uh, how to liberate these uh, this indigenous people from the elite capture to have the right uh, access to water. This goes to Kagera people. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let, let's have the responses to these two questions so that we don't uh, lose them out. So Dr. Maha, you can respond to the first question. And Dr. Guang, be ready to also respond the second one. And then after that, we shall also respond to the questions in the chat. So Dr. Maha, over to you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kalis. Thank you, Muhammad Saleh. Um, you are right in uh, all the derivations you have reached to. Uh, it is very true that we don't know in general how much the groundwater has changed in Khartoum. Uh, what I'm talking about is the non-changing quality of the surface water in the Blue Nile, the White Nile, and the Main Nile. Uh, in the groundwater, we have detected uh, many changes, but they are localized. We have no idea about the, all the groundwater uh, in Khartoum state, because you know Khartoum state is very big. So all the research that was done was done in localized areas after there were many complaints raised by the users of the water. Uh, you are quite right about the siphon septic tank. That is very true because most of the wastewater is injected directly to the groundwater. And we have no research indicating whether um, this is reaching all the water bearing formations or it is reaching only uh, the upper uh, aquifers or the unconfined aquifers. We also don't know whether uh, the unconfined and the confined aquifers, uh, their distribution in the, 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 the city of Khartoum, how they are distributed. And if there is, uh, there are areas where there are seepage from the upper aquifers to the lower aquifers that necessitates a lot of investigation and a lot of research. But for the little we know, the chemistry of the two Niles and the main Nile is not changing for the last 40 years, unless uh, some pockets where you have uh, some human activities going on and therefore the water gets polluted. But for the groundwater, we only know very little about uh, Khartoum State. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Maha. Dr. Guang, can you respond think, to the second question? Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Kalis, and thank you very much, uh, the person who asked the question. I think, uh, how do we do our waste elite capture? One of them is the reason why we're here. Uh, Nile Basin Initiative, the Minister of Water in Uganda is here, UNDP is here, uh, the funders of the research which I did, and I did make this recommendation to them that, look, when we talk about intervention and we want to make a life-changing intervention, go directly and do address the plight of these people. Um, when you look at what they want, they, they want, they're saying, can we have a tap? Can we have a water source? Can we have a source which we can easily access without competing with the, in, the, the local people? So the ministry and the government should also try as much as possible to vet the people or the organizations which are doing work there. You come with a work plan, say, look, I want to intervene in this area. These are the things that I'm going to put in place. And then there should be frequent monitoring 
to see that what these people have come to do are really being done on the ground. In that way, if you just want to go and exploit these people, you'll be forced to think twice. I think that's how we can go, go about it. Uh, you, um, the, the Nile Basin Initiative has conducted this assessment. I don't know what the final plan is for these people. But in my opinion, having found out what these people want, what do you have for them? I think that would be the question. What does the Minister of Water have for these people? Because honestly, they are the group which are on the lower end of bargaining um, capacity and negotiation powers. So that's how I would look at it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I see we have some questions in the chat, but I also wanted, before we close, I wanted the, the different panelists maybe give their perspectives again, building on the presentation they have made. We had the panel key question on how can geoscience help in promoting conjunctive use of groundwater and surface water. I know some of you have already highlighted that in your presentations, but I just wanted maybe just as we try to wind up this uh, webinar to just ask each of the panelists to try and emphasize some of these issues related to how geoscience can help in prom promoting conjunctive use. Can we now request uh, Dr. Shigidi Abdara, maybe if you can reflect on this in line also with what you have presented. And also maybe if you can also respond to any issue in the chat that you feel is appropriate. Over to you, Dr. Shigidi. Um, thank you very much, Perry, uh, for the opportunity. And uh, uh, I think the basic uh, theme in and what geoscience can, can, can provide is basically provide a clear understanding of groundwater and the dynamics of uh, linkage or interface between groundwater and surface water in terms of uh, impact, in terms of quantity, uh, impact of each, each uh, source on the other, in terms of quality, and the impact of uh, existing uses and uh, management practices on uh, the whole system in, in general. So, uh, it is it is it is it is really an important aspect of uh, uh, of water management uh, we have to look at the system as one unique system uh, uh, an integrated system of surf, of water water system uh, in which there is a delicate balance that has to be understood that has to be managed and there has to be a system of monitoring a system of governance and a system of intervention uh, whereby uh, this uh, resource can be effectively, efficiently utilized and managed. Thank you very much, Dr. Shigidi Abdara. And I request Dr. Nigate to also give his perspectives as we wind up this webinar. Dr. Nigate? Uh, yes. Yes, any perspectives on how geoscience can help in promoting conjunctive use of groundwater and surface water as you also make your final remarks? Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I will start from the question from uh, Dr. Maha. Why you don't use uh, chloride to detect recharge zones? We try to estimate the groundwater recharge using different methods. One of our methods is chloride mass balance method. And we try to uh, see the uh, spatial variation of groundwater recharge using chloride method. And uh, as, as you know, uh, uh, groundwater chemistry and isotope data is also very important to delineate or to identify recharge zones in an aquifer system. Uh, when I come to uh, how geoscience is helping uh, to manage groundwater resources or to, to, to appreciate uh, conjunctive use of surface and groundwater resources. Yeah, at this time, uh, it is the time that to just appreciate and use the uh, water resources uh, just conjunctively. Uh, because as you know, as uh, especially from in our area, especially if you take Bahardar, the surface water resources are 
minimizing because of the climate change. And people are commonly use uh, rain-fed agriculture, but now they are changing into using surface water for irrigation. And this was surface water is not sustainable for a yearly basis. So they are, they are using also uh, groundwater resources for, uh, for irrigation purpose. So when you talk about conjunctive use, we have to, uh, it's not only conjunctive use of surface and groundwater resources, we have to also think about managing resources. When you talk about surface water, we have to talk about groundwater. So conjunctive use of surface water and groundwater is a timely uh, question and is a timely uh, thing that we have to consider it to, to, to foster, especially for drinking or whatever, for irrigation purposes. Yeah. So in a Blue Nile Basin, as an Nile Basin initiative, appreciating and working on this uh, uh, conjunctive use and transboundary aquifer system is uh, essential and very important. And I think it's better to continue working on it. I know that there are transboundary uh, aquifer systems steady in the uh, part of Ethiopia and uh, Sudan. It's not a detailed work. It's not a detailed work. And that needs also a further investigation. Uh, it's not done by me or by somebody else, but uh, it is done by uh, Nile Basin Initiative. But I know the, 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 the process. So it needs more investigation to know the uh, the resources, because I have also raised the questions during the presentation of the professor from Sudan. Anyway, geoscience is, it's not that much utilized in the, in the previous time, especially in, in, in Africa or the, in, in, in East Africa. We don't use geoscience as a solution, right? But now we have to start to use geoscience as a solution to especially use water resources sustainably, because sustainability is also an issue at this time. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Nigate, for that perspective. Can I request Dr. Taye, you can do it in two minutes, in response to the question and also your perspectives on this topic. Thank you, Doc. Uh, actually, I haven't received a question, uh, but uh, mm, I see, uh, but I feel this, uh, the issue that uh, I raised is important and timely because uh, the Horn of Africa, as we know, is uh, um, severely affected by drought and all kinds of flood. And in, in the past decades alone, we have seen several in locusts, all kinds of uh, natural and man-made hazards are happening in this part of the uh, Africa. So uh, most of the solution, I believe that it lies in managing water. If we manage uh, our water resources properly, we can tackle uh, the conflicts that are uh, centered uh, among resource users. So uh, to do this, you know, the there is uh, our population is increasing, conflict is also increasing. We are a, a center of attention in, in different directions. We, it's, uh, it's difficult to uh, to sit alone and uh, be by our uh, ourselves. So uh, uh, we need to co to cooperate, and it, we need to have something beyond NBI. We have to bring all our uh, resources together. The 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 knowledge that we have. Uh, the resources that we have together and think beyond uh, even uh, what if NBI stops now, uh, who brings us together to manage our joint uh, water resources? So, so uh, uh, people or countries who are connected with a single water system, hydrologic system, need to work together and bring their, uh, their resources together. They have to do a joint research uh, activities, particularly the the uh, obscured groundwater system needs, uh, is, is poorly understood, is barely understood. So knowing these resources and understanding these uh, resources are need to be our prime uh, uh, objective. So we have to think beyond NBI and do something to bring all our resources together and uh, manage our uh, both our surface and uh, groundwater resources. And groundwater resources are most dependent and also uh, climate resilient resource that we might depend uh, on for the, in, for the future. That's what I want to add. Thank you very much, Doc. Thank you very much, Dr. Taye, for those perspectives. Indeed, we need 
we need to work together and understand this shared resource. I don't know whether Dr. Alexandros is still around. I know he had said he was going to leave, but I see him on the chat on, 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 online. In case he's there, he wanted to give him an opportunity to make one or two remarks. But let's move on uh, to Dr. Tom Ogwang. Any perspectives, if you can do it in one or two minutes as we wind up. Yeah, thank you very much, <clears throat> Chair. Um, basically, my perspective here is that uh, the geoscience, as we plan whatever we're planning, we need to take into context the social, cultural, and political dynamics within the region. Because um, we, in political science, we are saying water could be the source of third world war uh, if we're not seeing the one which is, if we don't consider the one which is taking place to be uh, a third world war. But water, access to water, is something that all the people collectively should agree on how to access it and how to use it equitably, irrespective of how big or small uh, a community is. In that way, we are going to have a peaceful region which can uh, promote development among the member states and the communities within those states. I think that's what I can say, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Dr. Tom Ogwan. Uh, let me now invite Dr. Maha, if you can give your perspectives and maybe try to put this together. I don't know, Dr. Maha, whether there's any other person that is summarizing, but just take this, use this opportunity maybe to make your final remarks. Also, as a custodian of this uh, webinar, to also give us your final perspectives before bringing the webinar to a close. Over to you, Dr. Maha. Thank you, Dr. Kallist. Uh, this has been a very informative and educative session uh, in answering how geoscience can promote conjunctive views. I think of geoscience as a tool that can solve various problems regarding um, the practical use of water resources and protection in, ad in, in addition to how to balance consumption, abstraction against protection, preservation of natural resources in general, and how to find nature-based nature um, solutions for all the problems that we are facing uh, regarding uh, drought, flood, and, uh, and so on. Uh, I would like also to think of um, how to educate our stakeholders so as to uh, guide us and provide the right consultation when it comes to water allocation or water use or water supply. Because if your stakeholders are not informed about their best interest, then whatever you do is not going to be in their best interest. So I think Dr. Guang has pinpointed a very important issue on how can we educate our people on water resources and how can we get the right um, consultation from them as our main users? Because all that we are doing is just to supply water and to meet the future demands. How can we do this if we are not really guided by the well-informed, educated stakeholders. And that includes not only the indigenous people, no, it includes even decision makers in the parliament, in the ministries, in, in the different sectors of the government. Um, knowing the, the quality of water and how to control and manage water resources is a vital issue because uh, in that aspect, we can provide and meet demands with, uh, in, in a good balance with uh, protecting our ecological systems, especially those which are uh, water dependent. Thank you, Dr. Kalist. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Maha. So ladies and gentlemen, I want to apologize for going beyond the allocated time. But these were very, very interesting presentations and discussions. And I would want to use this opportunity to thank all our speakers for the good information, the good work you are doing. 
A lot is being done in our region, and I think we need to work together to enhance the available capacities and the knowledge so that we can ensure that we have sustainable conjunctive use of transboundary surface water and groundwater resources. And I do hope that uh, through this webinar, all of us appreciate the importance of looking at surface water and groundwater together within a basin context. And the need to integrate groundwater and river basin management, I think has been well elaborated, whether it is a count at country level or at the regional level, we need to ensure that groundwater and surface water are looked at together because these are resources which are part of the same hydrologic cycle, but also utilization of one resource will have an impact on the other. We have also noted that we don't only really have to think about transboundary groundwater uh, resources, we also need to look at groundwater which have transboundary implications. I would like you to join me to thank our panelists, but also thank the caretakers, the people who have made this webinar possible. We had Dr. Maha, Irima, Mwasiti, organizing as part of the overall organization of the webinar series under Night Best Initiative. I want to thank you and wish you a nice day. And of course, remind you that the webinar series are continuing even tomorrow. So don't miss out. Over to you and wish you a nice evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs> Have a good day, everybody. Okay, bye, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much for our time. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Tomorrow, maybe. Yeah. Uh, you see? I think. I think. Uh, design. Uh,